Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, church. It is a blessing to be able to read God's word and explain it online. My name is Andrew, I'm the minister at Flemington Presbyterian Church, and we welcome you to our YouTube channel. Get connected with the links down below. Uh, would love to get to know you better. Join us at 10 a.m. at 26 Norwood Street at Flemington, and we can worship together in person. Uh, next week, we won't have a YouTube sermon up because we'll have a bilingual Indonesian service with the Reverend Hank DeWard with lunch afterwards. So please do join us, especially if you, if you haven't joined us uh, before or if you haven't been uh, for a while. Uh, we're continuing our series thinking about evangelism and mission, and we're looking at Acts chapter 8, verse 26 to 30. I'm going to read it, and then we'll look at it together. This is God's word, Acts chapter 8, verse 26 to 30. Now an angel of the Lord said to Philip, Rise and go toward the south to the road that goes down from Jerusalem to Gaza. This is a desert place, and he rose and went. And there was an Ethiopian, a eunuch, a court official of Candace, queen of the Ethiopians, who was in charge of all her treasure. He had come to Jerusalem to worship and was returning seated in his chariot, and he was reading the prophet Isaiah. And the spirit said to Philip, Go over and join this chariot. So Philip ran to him and heard him saying, reading Isaiah the prophet and asked, Do you understand what you are reading? And he said, How can I, unless someone guides me? And he invited Philip to come up and sit with him. Now the passage of scripture that he was reading was this. Like a sheep he was led to the slaughter, and like a lamb before its share is silent. So he 
opens not his mouth. In his humiliation, justice was denied him. Who can describe his generation? For his life is taken away from the earth. And eunuch said to Philip, About whom I ask you, does the prophet say this about himself or someone else? Then Philip opened his mouth and beginning with this scripture, he told them the good news about Jesus. As they were going along the road, they came to some water and eunuch said, See, here is water. What prevents me from being baptized? And he commanded the chariot to stop. And they both went down into the water, Philip and the eunuch, and he was baptized. And when they came up out of the water, the Spirit of the Lord carried Philip away, and the eunuch saw him no more, and were on his way rejoicing. But Philip found himself at Azotos, and as he passed through, he preached the gospel to all the towns until he came to Caesarea. Amen, and may God bless the hearers of his word. Uh, let me pray. Oh gracious God, we pray that you would open our eyes, help us to see the beauty of your word, give us ears to hear, and challenge us in our faith as we think about mission and evangelism together. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, Acts chapter 8, verse 26 to 40. Uh, the greatest evangelist, is evangelist um, There is an American news uh, weekly magazine called Newsweek. And in an article in May the 1st, 1950, they wrote about a man who they called America's greatest living evangelist. I wonder if you can guess who that might be. Of course, that was the late Billy Graham. And I wonder what you think about that title. Was he the greatest living evangelist because he preached to 250 million people? Or was it because of his charisma? His engaging, challenging sermons. Or maybe it was his altar calls. What actually makes great evangelism? Uh, As we continue to think about mission and evangelism in the month of August, I want us to see five things about evangelism in our story of Philip and the Ethiopian eunuch. Now, five things about evangelism. Uh, Firstly, evangelism is sovereignly planned. Secondly, it's spirit-led. Thirdly, it's scripture-centered. Fourthly, it saves souls. And fifthly, it spreads the gospel. That's five points. Sovereignly planned, spirit-led, scripture-centered, saves souls, spreads the gospel. And we'll quickly go through all five. Don't worry. Um, But let's look at it very carefully. Uh, Evangelism, firstly, is sovereignly planned. You'll see that in the first few verses. Uh, In the beginning of chapter 8 of Acts, it tells us that Philip uh, went down to the city of Samaria and he proclaimed to them the Christ. And so Philip is introduced as a deacon who is the Samaria's greatest living evangelist. Uh, the, 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 the news week would have gone crazy over Philip. Simon the magician gets saved. Philip is preaching to many. And in verse 26, it tells us that the, Lord, uh, the Lord's angel said to Philip, Rise and go toward the south to the road that goes down from Jerusalem to Gaza. This is a desert place. It makes it very clear that he's going to a desert place. But just imagine it for a second. If you were Philip, what would you think if God was leading to this random location, this desert place, this Gaza? Uh, Philip, in obedience, he runs. Uh, he, 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 he rose and went in verse 27, and he meets the Ethiopian, Ethiopian eunuch, a court official of Candace, queen of the Ethiopians. This guy had come to Jerusalem to worship and was returning seated in his chariot. And it tells us that he's reading Isaiah. Um, the interesting thing is he probably would have traveled all, uh, all the way to Jerusalem and, get, and would have been denied worship. Because in Deuteronomy 23, it banned eunuchs from worship, worshiping in the temple. And so um, this story introduces us to this random guy who's from Ethiopia and he's traveled a long distance. Uh, Google tells me that the distance from Ethiopia to Jerusalem was 2,500 kilometers. And remember in the first century, they did not have Qantas Airways, airlines. They didn't have cars. And so it would have taken a long time to get there. Not only that, this Ethiopian was not just any Ethiopian. He was a eunuch in charge of all the treasures for the queen of the Ethiopians. And on top of that, he was reading the prophet Isaiah in his chariot. 
I've never been to Uluru. I'd like to go one day. But just imagine if I went to Uluru and I met a guy who looked after the bank account of the king of Cambodia or some other random country and he was reading the Bible. I, I would not think it was a coincidence. This, this introduction of this Ethiopian eunuch tells us something about evangelism. You see, Philip would have never imagined that he would meet the treasurer of the queen of the, uh, for the queen of the Ethiopians. Who would have imagined it? I wondered for a while why in verse 26 it tells us the angel of the Lord instead of using the word spirit of the Lord. And I think the reason why it makes a distinction in verse 26 and in 29, which we'll see soon, is that the first few verses is trying to tell us a principle about evangelism. God wants to make it very clear that in evangelism, God is working, planning, and leading to make a situation in which the gospel can be presented. Evangelism is sovereignly planned. Evangelism is in God's control. And that shouldn't surprise us as Presbyterians. We have a high view of God's sovereignty. God's in control even in the unlikely candidate for conversion. Uh, we have the mission on Tuesday. We help all sorts of people. We might even meet those who are homeless, drug addicted, alcoholics, gamblers, and people with mental illnesses. You never know who you might meet on Tuesday. But if God is sovereign in ministry, in evangelism, then it means that God can save even the worst of sinners, even the most unlikely candidate. And that should challenge us to do hard things for God. Evangelism is sovereignly planned. And that leads me to the second point. I, I, I raised it uh, briefly. Evangelism is spirit-led. And so it's not only sovereignly planned, but spirit-led. Verse 29, the spirit said to Philip, go over and join this chariot. And so the spirit leads Philip to take, uh, to talk to this unlikely candidate. And verse 30, it tells us that Philip ran. The spirit led him to the Ethiopian eunuch and he didn't just walk there, he ran there. He ran with obedience to the Holy Spirit. All the spirit told him to do was go to the chariot. He didn't tell him what was going to happen. He didn't tell him what to do. Philip went up and just chatted with him. Uh, we don't need to think hard about maybe sometimes in our lives where we have that feeling where we should have talked to a person about the gospel. Maybe invited someone to church. Maybe that feeling in our hearts where we feel like we should be doing something for the gospel. It might be, it might be the Holy Spirit prompting you to do something. Maybe something like the Ethiopian eunuch. Maybe it's random on the bus, the person at Wolves or Coles. You never know. The homeless person on the street begging for help. But often instead of running to them and chatting with them and maybe sharing the gospel, very often we walk away or even run away. True evangelism is spirit-led. And when the Spirit leads, and when we obey and trust God, He will provide opportunities for the Gospel, even if it's really hard. It's a hard thing to talk to a random. It really is. But remember, if the Holy Spirit's living in us, the living God who leads and empowers, you never know what God might do. You never know how God might use you. And so as we are led by the Spirit, as we are transformed by the Spirit, let us run with obedience. We might not like where God is leading. It might be very hard. We might not be sure what we might need to say or do. But God will be working. And so evangelism is Spirit-led. Do we get any extra help? Well, evangelism is not only solemnly planned, spirit-led, it is scripture-centered. So we do get some help. Uh, what is the Ethiopian eunuch reading? What does Philip explain? Well, he's reading about the Messiah who was slaughtered on the cross, who died for sins. That's the gospel message. Jesus Christ died for sinful men and we need to repent and believe. And so that's what Philip does. He opens his mouth and beginning with the scriptures, he told him the good news about Jesus. 
Uh, the Ethiopian wasn't reading random literature. He wasn't reading War of the Rings, Harry Potter, Hunger Games, the six steps of becoming wealthy tri training book. He was reading the prophecy of Jesus in Isaiah 53. And so this further confirms God is sovereignly con uh, in control over this evangelistic meeting. This Ethiopian was reading this incredible passage in this big scroll. And he asks Philip in verse 34, what's this about? The Ethiopian wants to know more about God's word. And that's what Philip does. He begins with 53, Isaiah 53 and points him to Jesus. The word of God is foundational to having new life. It is foundational to evangelism. Because without the word, we can't show and explain to people why they need Jesus, a savior. It's through the word. God reveals to us the means to which we are saved. The Bible is foundational to evangelism. And in Romans 10 verse 14, it says, How then will they call on him in whom they have not believed? And how are they to believe in him of whom they have never heard? And how are they to hear without someone preaching? You see, the word of God needs to be explained to be evangelism. I used to go to a gym, used to go to the gym a lot, not as much these days. And I had an elder who wanted to lose weight and gain muscle. He was telling me um, that when he signed up to the gym, he was hoping that the workers would tell him how to use equipment and give him a, a workout program to help lose weight. But they didn't, and he said to me, how am I to lose weight, gain muscle if no one tells me how to do it? A fair point. So I met up with him, we went to the gym together, I showed him how to use the equipment, put him on a diet plan, workout plan, and told him that dieting and working out is central to losing weight. In the same way, we need to give people the workout plan, the diet plan for salvation. What's the workout plan, the diet plan for salvation? It's the Word of God, the Bible, the Gospel message. And so evangelism is Scripture-centered. It's not merely just doing good works. The gospel message, the Bible, needs to be there. Well, the good thing about working out and dieting is that you get results. If you stick to a workout plan, a diet plan, you will lose weight and gain muscle. And the result for evangelism is that that saves souls. And so we can have hope. Why should we take up the courage and follow the Spirit's leading in evangelism? Because it saves souls. And so from verses 36 to 38, we get the infinitely more important and urgent and noble task than getting a six-pack for winter. The Ethiopian eunuch hears the gospel, receives it by faith, and has salvation in Jesus Christ. And he is so keen that he wants to get baptized immediately. Praise God, evangelism saves souls. It saves even the most random person in the world. God had mercy on this Ethiopian eunuch who have never been able to enter the temple but by God's grace through Jesus now anyone can come to God some people would have thought that the God of Israel would have never cared about him but the great thing is that God does care and the Ethiopian eunuch is an example of God's mercy and grace even the most looked down people in the world it's so one amazing thing to know that evangelism can save souls. Doctor saves lives, heals diseases. We Christians, pastors, missionaries, evangelists have the great privilege to be doctors who work to save the souls of people. We work to save people's eternal life. And we have the cure for sin. There's no other cure for sin. The cure for sin is in Jesus. And so evangelism saves souls. And so finally, very quickly, at the very end, we learned that evangelism spreads gospel. It really does. Evangelism spreads the gospel and continues to spread. And Philip is taken away. And I don't know, I'm not sure about you, but what do you do after a long day? After a long day of ministry, preaching the Bible and leading Bible studies, I just want to relax. I just want to sleep. I just want to get a good sh shower. But verse 40 tells us that as he passed through, he preached the gospel to all the towns until he came to Caesarea. He kept evangelizing. Evangelizing didn't stop. Evangelizing continues to spread the gospel. 
It isn't a once-off event. It doesn't stop with just one person. It keeps going. And last week we saw Matthew 28, the Great Commission. Go therefore and make disciples of what? All nations. And so we are challenged to continue to evangelize, to spread the gospel week after week, day after day, and make disciples of all nations. Evangelism continues to spread the gospel. And so those are the five things. Evangelism is sovereignly planned, spirit-led, scripture-centered, saves souls, spreads the gospel. Um, it doesn't take long to hear about the influence of Billy Graham. Maybe you have been influenced by Billy Graham. Uh, he did preach to 250 million people. Uh, but what makes him a great evangelist is not the amount of people he preached to. But it's his faithfulness to God and the gospel message. He once said, I used to think that in evangelism I had to do it all. But now I approach evangelism with a totally different attitude. I approach it with a complete relaxation. First of all, I don't believe that any man can come to Christ unless the Holy Spirit has prepared his heart. Secondly, I don't believe any man can come to Christ unless God drives him. My job is to proclaim the message. It's the Holy Spirit's job to do the work, period. Uh, Billy Graham read the Bible, his Bible well. Uh, he knew the story of Philip and the Ethiopian eunuch. He knew that God sovereignly planned his path. He knew the Spirit was leading. He knew the centrality of Scripture. Uh, he knew that it would be saving souls. And he knew he had to continue to spread the gospel, the good news of Jesus. God planned his path. He called Billy. Billy ran and preached the gospel. God saved and Billy kept running. He kept spreading until he met his Lord at the age of 99. God has called you to go. Follow his leading. Trust in his sovereign plans. Build your faith on his word and share the good news of Jesus. And maybe this week, maybe today, maybe tomorrow, you need to take that step of faith. Sharing it with a family member, work colleague, a friend. You never know how God might use you. Amen. Let's pray. Oh, gracious God, we pray that you would help us to be better evangelists. We pray that you'd help us to trust in you, the greatest evangelist, the one who gave up your son, Jesus, who died for sinful men. Oh God, we pray that you would open doors for us, that you'd prompt us by your Holy Spirit, Soften our hearts, lead us, and give us great strength and confidence to share the good news of Jesus. Help us to make disciples of all nations for your glory's sake. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Hey.